So penciling, inking, colouring, storytelling, composition are all what makes comics. But what makes a career in comics? Tonight we have as our special guest an artist over, over a 40 year career has lent her elegant and glamorous line work to Spider-Man, Red Sonja, Barbie and Hulk Hogan, among many others. Please welcome our mentoring guest artist, the illustrious Mary Wilshire. Thank you for coming. Please have a seat. Thank you, Simon, for Thank your you. illustrious introduction. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a very, great pleasure to have you here. So, I'm going to go right back. Um, the first credit I have for you in comics is from women's comics back in the early 70s. Um, and that is quite an illustrious publication. Uh, there's quite some serious names involved in that. Um, you've got Linda Barry, Phoebe Glockner, Dan Newman, Aileen Kaminsky, Melinda Gebby, Trina Robbins. I mean, this is a deep bench now, even, like 40 years later. Um, you, your first credit I can find is Multiple Choice, which you wrote and drew by yourself. Yeah. How did you fall into this crowd? I mean, it's... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it Simple was, answer. It was a very happy accident. And there were a series of events that took place. Um, you know, I got my, my education at Pratt as a painting major. Mm -hmm. And I had no plans on getting involved with comics, but I always had a comic book, cartoony style of drawing, but mm -hmm. never just one particular style. And in fact, um, Pratt was the only school that um, accepted me of all the colleges that I applied to because in 1971, 72, when mm -hmm. I was applying to colleges, um, the idea of going to college and aspiring to be a comic book artist or a cartoonist was just, I mean, it's not you something know. nice people did. No. It's uh, you know, my, yeah. my family members wanted me to, you know, illustrate birds on plates or, you know, something respectable <laughs> like that. And uh, even when I was at Pratt, although I was really enjoying the painting, and uh, there's no question that it really mm -hmm. helped me in a lot of ways. Right. Um, you know, I was doing cartoons in the stairwells in the dormitory. You just graduated from Pratt with a, a qualification in painting. So you, did you think you were going to become a fine artist at that point? Was I that did. Your plan? Yeah. I thought all the galleries, you know, were going to be knocking at my door, you know, asking me to uh, show my paintings, and that just did not happen. <laughs> and, so what uh, did you do at that point? I mean, 75, you're, you're young and free and qualified to do very little of any practical value, has to be said. Um, and I think got an art qualification myself. Um, <laughs> what, what did you do to try and find work? What was well, your, what was first I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and um, Get out of the way first. Yes, you know, all my friends were trying to support me, so one showed up one day and said, look, I found this little ad in the newspaper that looking for women cartoonists. And uh, I went to meet them, uh, these two women, and they were doing a book called Titters, mm -hmm. and it turned out that um, one of the women was actually uh, one of the head writers on Saturday Night Live, and her boyfriend was Michael O'Donohue, mm -hmm. who was running National Lampoon at the time. I didn't know that. Right. Um, and I had been very lucky. I actually lucked into a job drawing like the insides of toilet tanks and stuff like that for Time Life Books, mm -hmm. um, how to fix it sort of stuff. So that was sustaining me, but I still wanted to do something that felt like it was a little bit more my speed. And I really liked these women. Mm -hmm. They were very funny mm -hmm. and they were very, um, you know, irreverent. And uh, it was a lot of fun working with them. And come to find out, the art director on the project was Judy Belushi. Of course, at that time, no one knew from, you right. know, I wasn't watching Saturday Night Live because mm -hmm. it was too late for me to stay up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember, you know, when I did a bunch of these illustrations for Titters, there was one time I went to Judy's apartment and John came out and his hair was a mess. I didn't know who he was. He was her husband. Mm -hmm. He looked like he'd been sleeping all day. He was wearing a Hawaiian shirt you know, a couple of days growth of beard on mm -hmm. his face. And, you know, I said, how do you do, blah, blah, blah. You know, I left the apartment. I'm walking to the subway. I pass the newsstand. And there's the guy that I just met mm -hmm. with his hair, just like that, <laughs> Hawaiian shirt on the front of, like, Time magazine or People or something like that. That was, was kind of his thing, wasn't it? It was freaky. It was <laughs> freaky. But there were a lot of fortuitous accidents. And I think it's just important to be yourself draw in the way that you do, mm -hmm. and don't worry about trying to plan out your whole career. Just do the next right thing. Mm -hmm. And if the next right thing is working on 
whatever in your, your notebook, your sketchbook. You right. know, you never know when you're going to have a chance mm -hmm. to do something with that. Yeah, and it's better to do something that you're actually committed to this of, your, of, your, of yourself and hope that someone else will appreciate that rather than try and pander to someone else's idea of what they think. I did a lot of pandering. Right. <laughs> or pander as well. Yeah. I, I did a lot of pandering. In fact, I think that was, you know, that was just the way I functioned. I was trying to, because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Every art director that I went to see, I just tried to do what it was that I thought they wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, what was that? I mean, what did that look like? Who was who? who well, you sometimes to be? it looked like the inside of toilet tanks, mm -hmm. um, and I drew a lot of hands, mm -hmm. you know, fixing things, and right. that was useful. And it was very, very wonderful to be able to draw anything for mm -hmm. an income. Yeah. And then, you know, I tried to do mechanical illustration, but I was terrible at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a chance to try storyboards. That was better mm -hmm. for me because I was able to draw out of my head mm -hmm. quickly. A lot of my best drawing is messier, but it's full right. of gesture and You tend animation. to find that with comic artists, they tend to be very good at storyboards because it's a lot under pressure and you have to kind of come up with stuff. Well, and I, I seem to be better at drawing things out of my head than I am from, draw, you know, doing things, you know, photorealistically. Mm -hmm. And um, I just really lucked into the situation that I found uh, so you were, in 78, you were working for National Lampoon. And in 1980, Larry Hama hires you for Crazy Magazine at Marvel. And Larry himself had only just been hired at that time for Crazy. And you were I didn't know that. That's very really? funny. Yeah. <laughs> so he was just fresh in the door. You brought, he brought new people in with him. Um, and uh, you were primarily a gag cartoonist at that point, point, he, he says. You know, I tried to do gags. But then mm -hmm. I found out that that's a very, very specific kind of skill. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have that. Right. I was trying to do gags and take them around to different magazines, but I didn't really get mm -hmm. any, you know, no one really was interested in my stuff, and my writing wasn't that funny. I was more interested in slice-of-life right. things, which are actually seem to be, you know, more popular now. Mm -hmm. um, I was just trying to do anything that I could, and mm -hmm. it was great to have had a chance to do something for the undergrounds. That was where I had a chance to just, you know, practice my, my storytelling skills, mm -hmm. uh, telling, you know, wacky little anecdotes that entertain me. It gives you me. kind of credibility, too. Well, if you had told me that at the time, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I would have said, but I'm glad that I did it. Right. And Larry gave me a shot. Uh, Crazy folded in 83, uh, and Larry wanted you to draw the Red Sonia comic. Actually, I came to him with something. I came Did you? with a little snippet of something that I had drawn from a Mary Renault mm -hmm. um, book. Mary Renault. Renault. And. Um, but you hadn't done much like comic book continuity at that point. I hadn't, but I thought that way. Right. You had I a storytelling instinct. I had. A, I just have a cinematic way of. Mm -hmm you know, thinking of stories in my mind. Because that's what Larry said. He's hired you because he knew you had that storytelling instinct. And not everybody has it. And you can be an illustrator, a fantastic illustrator, but not have that. He that said feeling. that? He did. Oh. He said many other nice things as well. <laughs> um, but he knew that you could do it. And you could also, you had a very glamorous way of making people look attractive, which he thought was important for the Red Sonja comic. So this wasn't the first, this was the second run of the Red Sonja comic. And it was, um, it wasn't the, the classic chainmail bikini one. You actually gave her a sensible costume. and That was Larry's. Was Ooh, it? That was Larry's idea. Larry designed that costume. Really? Okay, yes. that's interesting. So. Because it seems like there was a definite push at that point to make her less a, a male sex fantasy and more a female empowerment fantasy. Well, I think Larry was really, you know, Larry is a guy who will tell you how important mm -hmm. character development is, you know, to the impact of any story. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how interesting the story is if you don't care about the characters. And I think Larry saw that I was always... I was focused on expressions and relationships and the way characters would respond to one another. And I think maybe he, maybe he thought that... I That's could really strong in the comic. and It's very obvious looking at the work. But the thing about Red Sonja is it's an awful lot of sword fighting. I mean, this is something you hadn't really drawn before, I presume. No, I hadn't. And he coached me, you mm -hmm. know, a lot. I mean, there were times I would come in with a couple of pages and everything just got thrown out and he would sit me down. I mm. would say, oh, I'm going to get a cup of coffee. He says, sit down, he would say. <laughs> you know, I'd redraw it and draw it this way. And he would, I've saved a lot of the sketches that he did oh, really? to illustrate uh -huh. what he was trying to explain about how to create an establishing shot and how important that mm -hmm. is. And then he gave me Wally Wood's 22 panels that always work. I, I don't know how many people know about that here. It's become a, cr a crutch, I think. I feel I have, I have strong opinions about that, but yeah. Well, 
for me, <laughs> it was a crutch I really needed. Yeah. Um, and and right. you know, Larry said to me, "Think of Red Sonia. Mm. Think of her holding a baseball bat, you know, and swinging <laughs> it. Think of the weight, you know, of the weapon. Yeah. Think of how you have to counterbalance your body if you're hauling a lot of stuff on your back." He was so good with the acting, mm -hmm. you know, and coaching me to try to get those elements into the drawing. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was what I really enjoyed. That's interesting. I can't think of many editors who give, put that much time into getting talent to a certain point. There doesn't I, seem to be that much time anymore. I am so grateful to him. So there's another thing. You, you've done a, a couple of writing credits for you at that point, uh, mostly in conjunction with Louis Simonson. Um, and was that something you felt you could, could have done more of? Was that something you, you could, would have appreciated more of a chance to do? I'm not sure why I wasn't able to step up and really participate with that. I might have been intimidated mm -hmm. because, frankly, you really have to have an ego. You know, you have to have a strong <laughs> ego if you're coming into a situation where everyone's telling you constantly how your work doesn't fit in mm -hmm. um, or it's not right or this doesn't work or mm -hmm. your inking sucks. Um, you know, or whatever it happens to be. And, and I heard all of those things right. a lot. Um, develop a thick skin. I didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was lucky because I was able to work in other areas. I was able to, mm. you know, I did illustration, editorial illustration for other magazines. I, you know, I had the Blues Brothers thing. Mm -hmm. um, that was really helpful for my ego. Right. But I think, you know, at a certain point, I, I started to realize my personality wasn't really into comics. I wasn't into comics mm -hmm. quite in that way. Right. And um, Louise is such a pro. Mm -hmm. It's Louise Simonson, yeah. Yes, I feel so fortunate to have worked with her. And um, she and Walter are also such sweet people. What I really wanted to do with Louise was a romance comic. Really? And we actually penciled one almost completely. Mm -hmm. But the guys weren't interested in romance comics. Did you? I mean, uh, the other thing you were associated with at that time was the, the Firestar character, um, which was the kind of nice, coherent piece of work. The only piece you actually got is to develop yourself, it seems. No, no? I, I didn't develop Firestar myself. But, but it was created by the, for the TV show, but it was brought into the Marvel U by you and Tom DeFalco. Mm, I didn't have anything to do with that. I was really? just lucky to be right. the one that they asked to do it, mm -hmm. maybe because she was a girl, yeah. you know, and they thought I could draw. I was in the habit of drawing females mm -hmm. in ways that weren't conventional superheroes. Or exploitative, frankly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, speaking of which, you did a, a Spider-Man annual with Louis Simonson as well, which was uh, basically the Mary Jane annual, uh, where she's mistaken for Spider-Man's mistaken for Spider -Man's secret identity, Mary Jane Watson, <laughs> um, and then basically takes over the entire book, which was great fun. That was really good. But they, you and Louis, Louis Simonson seem to do an awful lot of uh, from that point on. You seem to be a team. Well, I wouldn't, I would, I would love to be a team with Louise. Really? Yes. That sounds like a good, I, I wish you try to encourage that. Um, the other book you were quite well associated with at the time is the Barbie comic. Yes, uh, that was fun. It's, it's a lovely comic. It's actually really good. I wish this had been around when I was buying comics for my daughter. Um, well, since you say that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to take the opportunity to mention that we really did try to push this mm -hmm. to the marketing department at Marvel. Yeah. We really thought that it would be a, a, an incredibly successful product. Uh, for little girls, if it were marketed at the point of purchase in supermarkets, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't do it. Really? So it was very, very frustrating to us. It seems uh, so crazy because it is, it is a great little comic. I mean, it's really well thought out, and it's, but the style is very engaging. And very a open. lot of wonderful writers on this, too. Yeah. Uh, women who were really interested in writing stories that would have some meaning for little so girls. L Lisa Trusciani and Barbara Slate? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. right. Did you feel you missed anything out? I mean, you were, did you feel you were being ghettoized as kind of like the girl department? Was that you? Or did you, did you feel there was something else you wanted to do at Marvel that you couldn't do? Yeah, I wanted to draw my own characters. I wanted to draw little kids, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I wanted to draw. You did Power Pack at one point. Yeah, well, thank goodness June Brigman got in on that, and mm -hmm. she did a really wonderful job. And that is a wonderful book right. for kids mm -hmm. yeah. um, and very wholesome mm -hmm. and interesting. And I would like to have done something like that, but it would have featured, you know, a mischievous little girl getting in a lot of trouble. And, you know, that was just like too, it wasn't, that didn't fit into the Marvel Universe at all. And then if I went to the publishers, you know, to try to pitch a storybook about the mischievous little girl, they'd say, mm -hmm. well, this is too cartoony. Right. 
It seems crazy because like the New York Times bestseller comics list right now is Raina Telgemeier and she's got three, four books in there right now and she's had them there for four years. It's wonderful. And it's, it's, it's girls comics, car com cartoony comics it's for great. girls. Well, so I, I really... You're vindicated in a way. <laughs> I'm very vindicated. I'm thrilled so. and I'm very, very proud of all the women who are doing such fantastic work these days mm -hmm. because um, there is tons of stuff out there now. It's true. It's yeah. wonderful. No, it's absolutely true. Now, you made an escape from the superhero industrial complex, and you went out <laughs> starting to do your own thing. Um, interestingly, you haven't really worked that much in pencil ink since that. You, mostly you're doing like pencils, charcoal, uh, not charcoal, but uh, I mean, for example, the, this book here, Fat Free. I did have a chance to draw an entire graphic novel in yeah. pencil. Yeah. Um, but I owe my thanks for that project to Jim Sherman, who mm -hmm. was the art director on it, mm -hmm. and felt that it was possible. It was just at the point where the digital um, right. capabilities were there mm -hmm. to make the artwork punchy enough mm -hmm. so that it would print. And um, it's a really good looking book. Well, again, uh, you know, Jim really, he really forced me to he made me redraw a lot of stuff and uh, try to get perspective better. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of the compositions for the design, you know, design the pages. Mm -hmm. And um, do you I like working in, I mean, pastels. I and love pencils. pencil, you know, yeah. and, and that's. Yeah. And when I watched your interview with Russ Braun, mm -hmm. I was so excited to hear him say that he works in pencil. Yeah. And then he, you know, sharpens it up. A little bit of magic in Photoshop, yeah. Oh, I'm really excited about that. I'm going to have to it's look into it. It's surprisingly common now. I know a lot of artists who do that now who don't actually it. ink anymore. Well, top of the list of my priorities is to get my digital skills down. But That's my major creative mm -hmm. project right. has been raising my daughters and making uh, a home mm -hmm. for the last 25 years or so. That's a major project. It's kind of a big shift, you know, so... I'm not exactly sure what I want to do now, but I do know that I don't want to be trying to squeeze myself into a little mm -hmm. box for an art director. It's going to be more important for me to try to... I have a lot of ideas about things that I want to do. Do you want to write and draw? You've got I would love to. Yeah, I would love to write and draw, but I love to work with a writer mm -hmm. or a person, a concept person who knows what they want, and I love to be able to bring that to life. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to do that with Larry on a project which actually turned into giant posters incorporated into a show at the New York Historical Society l this last year oh, really? about okay. Chinese immigrants. Ah. And it was fascinating. I did see that show. It was a wonderful show. Thank you. Yes, it was Thank great. You. Um, well, there was a tremendous amount of material in it, mm -hmm. but I had a chance to because they didn't have a way of showing graphically the experience of two or three generations mm -hmm. of Chinese immigrants, but they did have a lot of material from the family members and pictures and artifacts. Um, we cobbled together, we put the story together, we had the writer and I got to draw it. Mm -hmm. And boy, did I learn a lot of stuff about Chinese immigrants. And that was an eye-opening exhibition. I mean, there was, actually was a section on comic book depiction of Chinese immigrants, and it was like, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. That was uh, me. That was you. That yeah. was you actually did that. It was great. Well, I worked with, uh, with a yeah. whole team of people. Right. But I was, ironically, I was the inker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so go figure. Things so how do you, I mean, choosing a project, what do you find, I mean, you, you have been working consistently, as much as you say you're, you're, you're a wife and mother and so forth, but you actually have maintained regular, regular jobs. What attracts you to working? What do you, you don't presumably have to, but you do it for the pleasure of it. What is it that makes you interested in a job? You know, I love a job that, you know, I, I love to do something that feels like it has some meaning, some mm -hmm. level of meaning to it. I mean, I mean this, is, this is a great book about identity and sort of self-esteem. Yes, and in fact, I think I, when we were speaking earlier, before mm -hmm. the show, um, there were things that I really... Uh, for myself, I would have liked to play up about this woman's story mm -hmm. that I think would have been very poignant and mm -hmm. very meaningful for a lot of women who struggle with their weight. Yeah. And uh, I love the idea of addressing issues and stories, you know, that little girls can look at, mm -hmm. kids. Yes. Um, and I don't know exactly how that's going to come to pass, but I really have had a tremendous amount of experiences as a mother, um, you know, observing my daughters and 
what they've gone through and what, they, what they're going through now mm -hmm. um, that makes me really want to reach out to a lot of young people who deserve to have more support mm -hmm. than they are currently getting. Uh, we live in a very complicated world and I think human nature <sighs> remains the same. And people need to be treated well. People need to know that their feelings are valid. Mm -hmm. And people need to be, people need to have their feelings affirmed about everything that's frightening, everything that's valuable, and everything that's real. Mm -hmm. You know, in spite of all the superficiality we have and all the um, rotten things that are going on in the world. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I would love to have a chance to work with stuff like that and I do have ideas I have a you know I have a lot of ideas for things that I'd like to do mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm allowing I'm very fortunate that I'm in a position where I can allow those ideas to uh, germinate mm -hmm. in an organic way right. while I continue to you know try to get my ducks in a row as far as downsizing you know from a big house and mm -hmm. You know, getting those digital skills. <laughs> right. And I've got a, a good friend, uh, Jennifer Hayden, who's just done a, a very good book called The Story of My Tits, which is about breast cancer. But she's one of a number of women I know now who are in their 40s and 50s who are now coming to comics as adults, never having done them as, 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 as they never had to do them as, as kids or in their 20s. But they realize it's a very good means of expression because it's for the immediacy of it, as you're saying, it's, like it's something you can directly relate your experience. Well, and also, I think these days, more, it, it, it is like um, every child, every, anyone, no one avoids television or movies, mm -hmm. and you know, we've all gotten very comfortable with visual storytelling, and people are really seeing how important it is and, and how possible it is mm -hmm. to tell their stories and how well those stories can be received. Mm -hmm. Even if they seem, you know, very quirky or very frightening or um, very difficult. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, the more difficult stories that get told, the more supportive the it best, is the best story, to yeah. our culture. Okay, I have to ask, this is a slight tangent to this. Um, we sit down at a drawing table every day and do the same thing, repetitive action. Maybe get up, get coffee, come down, sit down again. It's not very good for your health. How do you manage to maintain a healthy life in doing this job? I'm an extreme gardener. That's it? I mean, I dig holes, I move rocks. I actually worked as a landscape architect in my own yard, which is pretty mm -hmm. large. Mm -hmm. And I diverted a runoff stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend, who is an excavator operator, dug some ponds for us. And I mean, I did a lot of very heavy So that's work. a secret, manual labor. And <laughs> <laughs> manual labor, well, you know, and I always, I, I do often think that archetypically, mm -hmm. housework is like monk's work. There are a lot of things that can be done. And mm -hmm. I have a physical therapist friend who taught me that you should always, anything you're doing, mm -hmm. like, I like being physical. You know, I have a long driveway and I go out and shovel. Mm -hmm. You know, you change sides. Always change size when you're doing something like shoveling or digging a hole. Change size so you don't injure yourself. So, okay. But I also swim, and when That's I was good. drawing Red Sonia, mm -hmm. I was very into weight training. All right. And okay. I found that that really helped. It really gives you an idea of muscles. I and, had, yeah. Yes, I had a very visceral feeling about body language. Mm -hmm. And um, I, do, I also do yoga. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I just don't, you know, I don't sit down at a, at a table and draw every mm -hmm. day, but I'm looking forward to a time when I will be doing it a lot more often. As am I. <laughs> so, last question. Um, in this position now, after your 40 year career, having done all, you, all that you've done, what would you say to yourself that comes out of the Pratt in 75? What would you say to yourself now from this perspective? To an artist starting out. Don't worry so well. much. Don't worry so much about what other people think of your work. It is good to listen to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I would tell myself, I would want someone to drill into me how much, how important it is to be disciplined, as Art Sudam said. I was not disciplined. I am not disciplined 
I'm very lazy. Mm. You know, I didn't mm. want to draw, you know, perspective. <laughs> I didn't want to draw monsters or weapons or buildings and, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't, animals. You know, you, you must use reference. Mm -hmm. And you must learn to look at things. Sometimes it's more important to look at something really, really well than it is to have a fantastic photograph. You right. know, to really take Process it in. Process it, take it in. And, but the and reference it. and the classes, anatomy, mm -hmm. you know, drawing, it's so important to have a sketchbook and draw all the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I was lazy, so I would tell myself, <laughs> get on the ball, take your classes. Tell them. Tell them right now. Keep up tell our with audience your... here right now. <laughs> <laughs> Discipline. It's very important. And you yes. know, another thing that Art said that, that is really true is mm -hmm. that, you know, when you're taking care of yourself physically, mm -hmm. It really enhances your ability to think creatively. And when you're doing something that's got you so focused, you know, in one little place, it becomes that much more important to balance it out, you know, with physical activity and mm -hmm. um, different environments. So like I would say discipline, yep. better health care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'd say. That's good. On that note, thank you so much, Mary. Thank it's wonderful you. talking to you. Do we have time for a Q&A? I think we've got a little bit of time for a Q&A. We can do that right now. Uh, Mary, what would you say is the most important thing, other than the discipline, you know, and everything like that, um, what would you say is the most important thing that most artists don't know about getting into the industry? About getting into the industry, I, I would say that it's, it's really important to maintain your sense of fun about what you're doing, keep a sense of humor, and uh, don't be so proud that you don't take a job that doesn't seem like that much fun if, if there's something that you can learn that will benefit you, or if you can be around somebody and, you know, it's worth it to be an intern for lousy pay or nothing if you have a chance to be around somebody who's really got their act together and who can teach you. Mm. And um, that's, good advice. that's probably helped me. I'm mm -hmm. just so grateful to all the people who put up with me, you know, <laughs> nosing around and told me how to do things differently. Keep your sense of fun. Keep your sense of self. Take care of yourself. Uh, but don't be afraid to take risks and... Um, you do have to get out of your comfort zone, and that can happen in a lot of different ways. Anyone else? You have another question over here? Over here, sir. Well, first off, I want to say it was really awesome to hear your story, and I would definitely love to see more women artists and writers and anchors get into the industry, because we definitely need more diversity. But um, my also question was, as a young artist trying to get out there, how can you find mentors that could, like how you had, that could sit down and really help you and train you to take you to that next level? And what do the comics industry like look for for artists to sketch out? Well, you know, the comics industry, I don't think, is looking, you know, the comics industry is made up of individuals. And all those individuals are looking for different things. There are people who work for companies that have a bottom line, you know, and they're going to want to find something that's um, very bankable, very predictable. But If you're doing the best you can at what you're doing and you just keep moving, I would say again, don't worry about planning your whole life career. You know, just do the next right thing. You know, and sometimes the next right thing is just focusing in on your, your sketchbook and sometimes it's stopping working. You know, I, I find it's, don't you find it's very cyclical that there are times in terms of your personal creativity where you just have to drop everything and you know, recharge yourself. Go on in vacation. Another... Yes, vacation. Vacations are good. I recommend them. It's very important, <laughs> and this is this is one of the important ways that we have to take care of ourselves as yeah. artists. Because you know, when you're an artist, you you see everything, you you sense everything. You know, you're. It's like exhausting emotionally, especially when you're putting it down on paper as well. So you got to give yourself a break. And um, just trust that if you just keep moving, just keep doing some, just stay in motion. And when you're tired, stop. Then you can get into motion again. And, you know, if you just keep circulating and talking to people, getting your work out there, 
you know, you, things happen. Think positive about what you have to offer. It's because I really do believe energetically, mm -hmm. you know, you draw things to yourself, you know, when you have a positive attitude about what you're doing and what you're capable of doing. I think on that note, thank you so much, Mary. Oh, thank you so much.